Welcome everyone to this um, Empower Regional Learning event. We basically wanted to share with you some of the work that Plymouth and Nottingham have been doing around looking at newer ways to engage and work with um, taking a more people-centered approach to fuel poverty and sort of alternative ways of financing that. Back in the early noughties, the council recognised that um, they alone were not going to get to where we needed to in terms of energy transition and fuel poverty um, and set aside to uh, help a community run organisation, um, a community owned organisation to establish uh, that would try and tackle some of the energy issues. Uh, and that was back in 2012. Uh, some of the key issues we were looking at there, fuel poverty, trying to cut energy companies out of the uh, the local economy and have more kind of circularity of funds in the local economy and to try to increase renewable energy. All that formed an organisation called Plymouth Energy Community. Um, and that's grown enormously in the last eight years. We own 32 installations of solar panels in the city, including a five megawatt solar farm. Um, we have a team of, I think about 10 advisors now, delivering fuel poverty work in the city um, with huge impacts. We saved people in the city uh, about 1.3 million pounds um, last year as a result of the advice we delivered. And that's, you know, savings within a year of the advice, um, helping over 2,000 households with one-to-one -one support around energy. Um, we've also got various new ambitions. We have a new housing project. We're trying to build 70 affordable zero carbon houses in the city. Um, we've got art-based energy engagement projects um, and the area that I'm talking about particularly today is some of our retrofit projects that are coming in. With the LAD funding I was talking about the crucial thing we wanted to do is is disrupt that model where a local authority procures one installer to deliver that um, and they are in charge of the whole process and we wanted to move to a system where we the, the council acts only as a grant body so it grants funds to householders so it puts the householders in charge of what happens in their home uh, and it can do that with you know any any installers that meet their eligibility criteria and we make sure that the householders then have an organization to support them to make those decisions so Plymouth Energy Community then coming in to provide advice and support to households including accessing retrofit coordinators and retrofit advisors to provide that um, Alongside that, we also maintained a, a recommended installers list. So we did a lot of work to engage with the installer market locally um, and to establish what offers people could provide so that, again, we can provide customers with something to help them make those decisions and access what, what would be best offers for them. That is quite a different model than, I mean, it's not, it's not unique. There are other people who've done similar things in the country, um, but it is quite a different model than that traditional model of, um, procuring one installer to, to manage all the works, to manage all the eligibility and the, the kind of grant process for that. And actually, we think there's been a really good impact from that. It's by no means a perfect model, and I'm not going to hold this up as the exemplar of a perfect project, but I don't think anybody would of a last project that they've been delivering in the last year. Um, and the headlines of that, yeah, we didn't spend all the money. We, we were not surprised by that. It was an ambitious project, but we did help. 127 households retrofit their homes, um, an average spend within that of about £9,000. So some quite in-depth retrofit in there. One of the really key things happened there is almost all of that went to installers based within our local economy. And we thought that was important to begin with because those are installers whose futures and their rely on their reputation locally. These are installers who are you know, not normally involved in the eco uh, supply chain for example the energy company obligation kind of national funding supply chain and so they are used to doing their work locally based off their reputation so this we felt was really important to make sure we're getting the best value and make sure that um, we're delivering good quality work this is you know better than writing in a whole load of clauses in a contract about what regulations you have to stipulate to this is a really natural way of making sure you're getting really good work 
and some of the results from that in terms of feedback from households was also really strong. Again, it, we did get that sense that having an independent organisation providing advice that is focused on giving the best advice to the household and, and supporting them through the process made a big difference in terms of um, households going through this scheme. So in the Carbon Reduction Energy and Sustainability team, we have um, host a domestic energy efficiency and fuel poverty subgroup, which is a subgroup of the Health and Wellbeing Board, and that reports on fuel poverty across the city. Um, with the main aims to reduce energy bills, improve energy efficiency, and maximise household income. The progress to date, um, we've got a successful track record, as um, the previous slide shows, of applying for funding bids um, and supporting households across the city. The latest stats um, for fuel poverty show that there's nearly 19,000 households in Nottingham in fuel poverty. That's based on the low income, low energy efficiency from 2018-2019 data. Um, I'm expecting the new data to be released in the next few months for the 2019-2020. So we've got the domestic energy efficiency fuel poverty subgroup keeping a track of this. Um, the group is um, a stakeholder engagement with Nottingham Energy Partnership, um, the various um, various departments across the council, including the housing team, um, Age UK attend, um, the universities have input into it because quite a lot of the student areas show us um, high fuel poverty areas in the city, um, Nottingham city homes are present. So it's um, across the city working on fuel poverty um, projects and um, engagement with citizens. Challenges that we face often come with implementation of the funding within the timescales available. Um, just in it mentioned this with, with LAD as well, that's been a challenge. Um, and the funding calls sometimes don't always align with what um, the council can implement or what's already going on. Um, and um, with LAD as well, there was a, an issue with getting qualified installers to do the work within the time frame, um, and that was addressed by having a training programme running alongside LAD, which was welcomed. So the concerns first, I think two of the main issues we we've been concerned about is that actually a lot of the programs which are there to retrofit the homes of people in fuel poverty are not benefiting the most vulnerable people. The second one is that actually they're not delivering effective efficient retrofit programs at all. through things like LAD funding, LAD funding that's coming through to local authorities and HUG funding that's coming through to local authorities, but that's not enough, it's not going to cover it. Uh, and really there are a whole load of other beneficiaries when we retrofit a home, the occupant, landlords, health, health services, local authorities, district network operators, who all benefit in some ways from this. And how is there a way here that we can actually start to bring together these partnerships to provide some of the things we need, trustworthy advice and support, better resources to do a whole house retrofit and, and longer term investment horizons that can kind of galvanise the installer network and, and galvanise our services to deliver things more efficiently.
So starting with thinking about why take a person-centred approach, um, I think sort of the key message from this research is that properties don't experience fuel poverty, it's people that do. And vulnerability to fuel poverty is only partially about property, the property that people live in. And we can learn more about fuel poverty if we think about it more in terms of energy vulnerability. Um, of the individual and the household. People experience fuel poverty in different ways. Um, So the initial symptoms of fuel poverty can can be quite wide ranging and it's not just high energy bills, it can be about rationing fuel and ways to cope with being cold. Um, And the detriments that people experience as a result of that are also um, different for different people. It could be poor physical health, it could be financial strain, it could be uh, family relationships. Um, but that, uh, those detriments have a wider negative impact than just that household. It's going to affect other stakeholders that they interact with, their doctors, their landlords, their employers. So a person-centred ha- approach helps in two ways. Um, firstly, to identify interventions where they might be most beneficial, taking into account what individuals are vulnerable to and what they're suffering from as a result of fuel poverty. And secondly, um, to look at that wider impact of how those stakeholders are affected, and, you know, how they could potentially help or could benefit themselves from helping those individuals. So the idea is that if we can better target fuel poverty interventions and, and uh, 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 what people are suffering with as a result of fuel poverty, um, you can deliver better outcomes uh, for those households and individuals. And then, the, the aim is that that will have a positive wider impact on those other stakeholders, so deliver co-benefits to them. And that's kind of the foundation for the research, um, that a person-centred approach can better target vulnerable individuals and households, promoting a worst-first approach, but that also it supports a more holistic approach based on the knock-on impacts on, on that wider group of stakeholders. So the persona approach, um, these are archetypal users, they, they embody real users, but they're, they're not individual case studies, they're, they're based on a broader evidence base, but they're easy to assimilate in their inner personal form. As I said, they're, they're based on wider evidence from this literature review, uh, which is, you know, they're only good as the evidence they're based on, so that's why we started with the literature review. But they help summarise that in a way that we can kind of present and understand. So it helps us focus on on who we're really looking at when it comes to fuel poverty. So we know that, and then we can have a kind of user centered device, um, design that we uh, uh, have a clear focus on on who you're trying to help. And I think most importantly in this case, when we're trying to engage a wider group of stakeholders, um, it presents that evidence in a really personal and believable way that engages the empathy and interest from stakeholders. Um, I think we can't take in a broad amount of data, it's difficult to to absorb that, and and our brains respond better to stories that engage our emotions, so the aim is to to have that sort of engaging approach, but it's based on the evidence, it's not anecdotal. So we developed six personas, um, which between them cover all the kind of vulnerable characteristics and the symptoms and detriments that we identified in the fuel poverty literature review. So the first one is an older home, a couple in worsening health and mobility. The second one is an older single person in rented accommodation with worsening health. And the third person is a single parent in rented accommodation, a large family in rented accommodation, a family with a disabled adult or child uh, in a home that they own with a mortgage, and a young single person in rented accommodation. those two personas hopefully have given you some indication of who might be impacted by fuel poverty and how and how that kind of differs and that detriments don't just impact individuals but have a wider impact on the stakeholders that they engage with so again the model that you know you can now sort of see is is demonstrated through the causal chain that's in the evidence shows that those positive outcomes lead to a positive impact on a wider group of stakeholders just to quickly summarize i mentioned some of them so obviously health service and fewer use of their services and and financial impact on them. Employers in the local economy, so there's also evidence that um, people have fewer sick days um, following energy efficiency works. And there's a a broader economy benefit from having jobs in the green um, sector and that supply chain and potential economic effect through the rebound effect to higher spending. Landlords I mentioned have a lower tenancy turnover and vacancy, but also have increased property value if they upgrade their homes. Energy suppliers have that reduced arrears and debt collection costs. And then the energy system, the district network operators more broadly, 
um, there's research in particularly from the US that shows the benefit from to them from actually having lower energy demand. Uh, it means that the demand during peak times is, uh, is reduced so that they don't have to invest as much in the reserve systems to handle peak loads. And they just generally have lower need for um, lower generation costs. Um, they don't have to, they can defer their distribution upgrades and reduce mine losses. So some kind of technical ways in which the energy system benefits from having lower demand. <clears throat> So just quickly to conclude, so this person-centred approach um, we think could be more effective by targeting most those most in need according to the symptoms and the detributes, detriments that they experience and hopefully the personas developed through this help convey that evidence and it highlights the wider impacts and then also identifies those stakeholders that are affected. And the potential benefits from working in partnership with those stakeholders is they can help identify those target groups who are displaying those symptoms, um, either through their frontline staff or other data that they hold. And then those mutual co-benefits um, might financially benefit those stakeholders, so that might give them the incentive to co-invest in fuel poverty initiatives. So um, we think that a person-centered approach is therefore compatible with this kind of holistic partnership approach. The answer that it gives us a much more long-term investment platform and also my answer to some of these questions is to, to look at those beneficiaries that benefit when we retrofit our home and there are lots of them um, and Alice has you know highlighted some really key ones in there and and who benefit quite a lot when we retrofit homes and how can we then work in partnership with those beneficiaries hopefully for them to bring some resource to the table, whether that's financial resource, whether that is um, collaboration and, and better working practices. And there are lots of examples of where this is done in very small ways. What we're looking at with this project is where's the capacity for us to do that is a much more kind of holistic programme. The person-centred approach is really important to that because if we're approaching a, a clinical commissioning group, the, arm of the NHS that does a commissioning in the local area to say look how can you help us to deliver retrofit to more homes and we say and what we'll do is we'll do that just to all homes in fuel poverty it's a less convincing case than us saying we want to work in partnership with you to access those homes of people who are frequently accessing your services people who've got respiratory issues people who've got mental health issues those kind of issues that's where our focus is going to be and if you can bring some resource to the table here that can allow us to focus this grant funding we've got coming in to those households and to do a better job of helping them than if we were just doing it with um with the grant funding alone landlords uh, owner occupiers they all have a stake in this and, and with the right and it may not all be more grant funding some of it might be finance so for example a lot of householders a lot of homeowners have got a lot of capital in that house again if you can find the right approach if you can find the right investment finance to support them to, to go further than the grant can take them to make sure that we can properly address the issues of their home there are people who are interested in doing that so with that person-centered approach it's both a tool to have a look at how we focus our uh our work when we are um, implementing uh, projects to improve homes but also how we can focus our engagement with those stakeholders there are examples of this and we don't have the time to run into those examples necessarily but those have happening in you know health services combining with fuel poverty services for example we're delivering a landlord's project that's doing a similar thing there are local authority based loans to support householders to do this these are kind of working but there's a feeling now that we need to draw that together in in a way and having you know different relationships coming together as a kind of big retrofit partnership for cities and that's what this project's about the real sweet spot is when you bring these anchors together as a network and Claes have done this work in quite a few places now across the uk to establish these networks um, and the kind of most well-known example is Birmingham. I'm sorry if this is a, a bit blurred. Um, so Birmingham um, is uh, an anchor network made up of um, nine anchors, actually, uh, including the NHS Trust, um, two housing associations, the council, two of the city's universities and the, um, the police. And the work that they've done in Birmingham really focuses on pulling together a collective holistic approach to 
in particular two of the five pillars, procurement and workforce. And the most interesting example, I think, for you guys, just for context, um, is workforce. So the work that they've done is um, that the NHS Trust recognised that they had a massive gap in terms of their recruitment and they weren't able to get local people into jobs and also they were struggling to recruit in general and this was through the pandemic and um, the local housing associations recognized that they also had a lot of people who lived for them who were struggling to find employment struggling to retain employment and also there was a gap in terms of pre-employment support for them so off the back of this and through the anchor network those two institutions got together and firstly used the housing associations deep connections into their local communities to basically support people into a position where they could explore recruitment with the NHS and the NHS used the housing associations expertise to break down all of the sort of um, recruitment barriers to those people this is fascinating and really needed um, I think the personas work um, and the fact that this isn't just about housing stock, it's about people's experiences is, is really important. This is a public health priority. It's an economic priority. It's a housing priority. It's an energy system priority. And it's a priority when we're thinking about more broadly tackling poverty. It's clearly cross-sectoral and it really requires deep collaboration to drive change. So we find that setting up anchor networks with a clear action to start with is a great way to get them moving. And why couldn't that task? be retrofit.